It's monetizing that, right? Our relationship, who we are, our personhood. So they own us. You don't own you. I don't own me in this digital era. Have you ever wondered why it's so hard to put your phone down? Google, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, even YouTube. They all collect massive amounts of data about you, and then they use it to sell you things. But they also use tricks to make you stay online longer. They emphasize disagreement. And all of that has led to a rise in mental health issues and a divided society. Well, Frank McCourt is on a mission to change that, to make the internet and social media work better for us. He's the executive chairman of McCourt Global, He's the former owner of the LA Dodgers, and he's the author of Our Biggest Fight, Reclaiming Liberty, Humanity, and Dignity in the Digital Age. Here's our discussion. Frank, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, the timing for this conversation around online safety, I, I, I don't think it could be any better because I feel like there's a little bit of a groundswell that's just starting to happen around awareness for the need for more online safety. We had we had the TikTok conversations in D.C. recently, which was driven uh, by a concern for national security, but it goes way beyond that, right? It goes, it goes into, to privacy. It goes into how social media and certain big internet companies are, 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 are collecting our data, how they're storing our data and how they're monetizing us. And, and that kind of is the, the starting point for, for your book, our biggest fight. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Thank you. And I wrote our biggest fight to shed light on project Liberty, which is a a uh, $500 million initiative to to actually uh, fix the tech, for sure, but also further socialize this issue and, and, and get a movement started so that uh, we can we can change things. And, and it starts by recognizing that things don't need to be this way. And then, of course, we need to build up that alternative so that um, we can have a, you know, a healthy, uh, constructive, awesome Internet uh, that that really supports you know, supports our democracy and gives us, uh, uh, you know, sharpens our information ecosystem so that we can always be in that constant search for the better truth and the 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 the, the, the sharper facts and and, and actually, um, you know, be be curious and uh, and, and get smarter because that is what has driven civilizations over time. And then, of course, uh, the thing that just it, it concerns me the most is is you know the harms now to children which are are proven and we need to address this with urgency because we as adults you know and parents have uh, the obligation to to protect children and not just our own and, and this is uh, this is you know why I'm engaged in this work it's to reclaim our personhood from the machines of big tech and uh, I say personhood because our data in the digital era is our personhood. Make no mistake, it's us. It's us that's being stolen by these platforms. And that's something that's totally unacceptable. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And one of the things that you illuminate so well in your book, which you wrote with, with Michael Casey, is just how much we are being surveilled. I'm pretty aware of all this. This is a bit of a hobby horse for me. And even I... Uh, was shocked. A couple of things recently, car companies admitting that they're selling data from driving habits and behaviors and destinations, selling that information to uh, insurance companies, among others, but they're making a ton of money selling that data. I, I don't recall ever consenting to have data from from my driving habits be shared. Uh, Reddit just went public. And one of the things that they said they're going to do to generate profits, generate revenue, is sell their user data uh, and, the, and their user behaviors to AI companies to train large language models. I have a feeling most Redditors didn't see that coming. Uh, and then you wrote about something that... I don't think I appreciated at the time when it came out in 2016, where you talked about Facebook's social graph. Can you explain that concept of a social graph? 
Yeah, it's, I think it's at the heart of all this. And the beginning of the internet was really the adoption of a very, a very thin layer protocol uh, or two protocols that were co-joined called TCP slash IP. And that was, um, a, a protocol that when devices logged on to that protocol, they were connected, right? So it was the beginning of the internet, which it was an internet of devices. And, uh, uh, one footnote, I mean, we are still, an IP address on the internet today. We're still a device. We're not a person. You and I are not on the internet. Our devices are on the internet. Then in 89, Tim Berners-Lee comes along, another thin layer protocol, HTTP, and that was all about data linkage. And so now both decentralized, everything's going along fine so far, but then around the turn of the century, um, uh, you know, 20 some odd years ago, we entered a new era of the World Wide Web, which was the app era. So something that was built to be decentralized was suddenly uh, the, 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 the idea was a race to collect our data and aggregate it and figure out what to do with it later. But whoever had the data would fit, would be the winners, right? So these, these apps that became the giant dominant apps of our, of, uh, of our daily lives today uh, were the ones that won that battle. And what they realized it, what it was that it wasn't data, just, just data in the abstract sense. It was our personal data that was valuable. And that's become, that, that's technically called the social graph, right? Or our social graph. So, um, it, it think of it as a mapping of all of society and all of the interconnections, which are quite vast and intricate. And then each of us is individually profiled within that societal mapping. And so it's everything about us that gets targeted. And then that's how we're manipulated. So it's, it's about not just what we know that, you know, we like blue sweaters, you and I, right. And so, and we, and we might be in the market for that. It's how we think. It's how we behave. It's they're making judgments about our personality makeup, our uh, our emotional reactions. How it's it's highly manipulative because they know more about us. When I say they, the machines and the algorithms, than we know about ourselves. Hundreds of thousands of individual data points, and then that is is it, that's the holy grail of the centralized app era. Um, internet. It's, it's monetizing that, right? Our relationships, who we are, our personhood in this digital age. So they own us. You don't own you. I don't own me in this digital era. They own us. And that's what needs to change. And I believe we, I know we can. I believe we must. The impacts are irrefutable. I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing it in society's mental health, the demand, especially among younger people, the demand for counseling on college campuses has never been higher. Colleges can't keep up with it. Uh, We've never been more divided in this nation. I think that's probably an irrefutable fact at this point. And you point out a, uh, a, a national happiness survey that, uh, there, there's a few of them. Uh, I've interviewed, interviewed the CEO of Gallup. He does one every year and he talks about, uh, global happiness and how the United States continues to rank lower and lower and lower every year in just general happiness. I mean, this, this is having a real impact on people. Fundamental point I make in, in the book um, is that the, the problems that we're seeing, the harms that we're seeing uh, that you, you've just referred to, th- this, it all can be connected to how this, how the technology that we're now dependent on is, ha, has impacted us and is, and, and impacted our ability, uh, to govern, uh, impacted our ability to, uh, ascertain the truth, internet, uh, uh, you know, it's impacted our ability to trust one another and trust institutions. And it is, uh, it is really stealing adolescents from children. It is really stealing their childhood by preying on them. And, and if I were to say to you, like, let's do this thought exercise that I'm the, I'm the head of the postal service 
and I have a deal for you. I'm going to deliver your mail for free. No more postage stamps, no more cost. I'm going to do it for free. Um, you'd say, well, you know, tell me more. I would say, yeah, I'm going to put a camera in every room of your house, in your car, in your workplace. I'm going to, I'm going to surveil you. I'm going to follow you around 24 seven. I think you'd be, you'd find that very creepy. And, um, and I'd say, yeah, it's creepy, but it's, it's now it's free. You're getting it, for, you know, the mail delivered for free. Oh yeah. One other thing I should tell you is I'm going to open your mail and everything I read is now mine. Your relationships are now my relationships. Your thoughts are now my thoughts. Your ideas are now my, my ideas. I think you would probably say not only is it creepy, it's very unfair. And then when I told you, I'm going to read your 13 year old daughter's diary. And what, what I learn about her and her insecurities, I'm going to prey on and I'm going to profit from. So if her, if her insecurity is her weight, I've got stuff to sell her and I'm going to make her feel worse about herself and her weight because that's, you know, that's what's going to make her, you know, buy my whatever stuff I'm going to sell her. So not only is it creepy and not only is it unfair, it is harmful. It is killing kids. So this, we would never let our government do it. Why are we letting five companies do this to us? Yeah, you and I are old enough to remember the the promise of the internet. We we were old enough to remember what it was like before there was internet, right? And so when the internet came along, the promise was that it was going to be this force for good, uh, been put information at 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 everyone's fingertips, democratize information, and and it has done that to some extent. Um, uh, but but there is definitely a. a a nefarious side to things. Let, let, let's talk a little bit about how we got here, because the, it, it, if you go back to the start of social media, uh, you point out in your book how a few individuals, which then turned themselves into, into the heads of companies that became behemoths, they figured out that if you could trigger a dopamine release, a little dopamine hit, a feel-good chemical in the brain um, that it would make people come back. And so they wrote algorithms to make that happen. That's the same thing that OxyContin does. Uh, no one, I think, would argue that the painkiller epidemic in this country had a good side. I mean, it's been, it has been a terrible, terrible thing. And there were bad companies and even bad individuals behind it. And yet, up until very, very recently, we really haven't had this level of discussion around social media. Why do you think that is? Is it, is it the money? Is it the influence? Is it the wealth? And it, uh, is it DC? What, what's held it back? Or is it just awareness? Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's ironic that we're called users uh, uh, huh. on the internet, right? That's yeah. that's kind of what you call drug addicts, you know? And uh, so we're people. And uh, I said earlier, you know, we, we, we shouldn't be an I, I, we shouldn't be a device on the internet. We shouldn't be, you know, data on the internet. We, it's you and I should be on the internet. We should be in control of our social graph. We should be in control of who gets to see what portions of our data and on what terms. Why not have an internet where, Rather than click on the, the terms of use and conditions of use of these big platforms, there's apps built that click on our terms and conditions of use for our data. And we get to see how it's used. And if it's making money, we get to participate. So I think we're there. We, we need to change this and we know we need to change it. You know, I see it. I feel it. You, the, you know, the harms, the problems. You see them. You feel them. And I would bet, I would venture to say millions and millions of people are now seeing it and feeling it. And, and as you point out, in accelerating and increasing numbers. So we, ha we have to change this. How do we get here? I think it was drip by drip. Uh, we, we entered this new world. And by the way, Project Liberty is pro-internet. It's pro-technology. It's pro-business. I'm just not pro a, 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 an internet that's ripping us apart, that's destroying democracy and harming kids. And so we, we as you said earlier, we entered this with an open mind, and an optimistic view. We said, okay, we have great, great lives. Let's make them better, not make them worse. And so this decentralized, empowering, liberating, uh, internet that was going to be the t proverbial tide that lift all boats was fantastic. But the reason I pointed out the shift 
from a decentralized internet to a highly centralized one, to an autocratic one, to an exploitive one, to a surveillance one, is where we went off the track. And, and you know, I hear people saying we need a digital bill of rights now because of, you know, all, all, all of go what's going on. And I say, no, we don't need a digital bill of rights. We need the technology that is omnipresent in our lives and now indispensable to respect and honor the bill of rights we have. That's what we need. Because what we're what we're looking at right now, in my opinion, is an entire political system and democratic process, which is designed to protect us as individuals. And we've signed on to a social contract to respect those rights in others so that they mean something. And we have technology, very powerful technology that's indifferent to those rights in that political system. It's actually at odds with it because it's autocratic and centralized and surveillance based. One of the two has to change. Either we are going to become an autocracy with, with people in power that, that treat us as subjects, not citizens, and know everything about us and can punish us because we're being surveilled, or the technology is going to have to adapt to our democratic principles so that we're respecting individual rights, giving people choice, autonomy, liberty, freedom, respect, and so forth. You can't, we can't have this dissonance we have now between our democratic system and the rights we are theoretically protecting and technology that could care less about those rights and is actually destroying them. So I think we're at the fork in the road and we need to decide as a society which way we go. The CEOs who run these companies now know that we know that they knew the damage their algorithms you know, were doing and yet they haven't changed. In the pre-internet world, we would appeal to our politicians and say, the CEOs aren't fixing it. You need to pass a law, regulation, and you need to fix it and force them to. Unfortunately, our politicians are disabled by the same very technology because social media has divided them into two camps, both thinking they're 100% correct, they're dysfunctional, they're paralyzed, and we're, this, we're suffering. So what does that leave us with? That leaves us with us, citizens, that need to move forward and take matters into our own hand. Fix the tech for sure through innovation and creativity, which Americans have in abundance, but also come forward and say, we care about our democracy and we especially care about our children. So we need to move forward and, and, and make sure that this all changes in a way, you know, whether politicians can get something down or the CEOs change to me at this stage of the game doesn't much, much matter. I hope they do, but it doesn't much matter. The reason I wrote the book is to ring the alarm bell and say, this is a call to action. It's our country, not theirs, right? These are our children that we have a, 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 a a sacred obligation to protect. And I'm talking about not only my seven children, I'm blessed with seven, but I'm talking about all children. We are failures as adults if we don't protect children and the next generation, and we're failing. Agreed. And I see it anecdotally. I see it with my nieces, uh, with my friends, uh, children. Um, th there's real harm being done. So, so, Frank, let's talk about the solution that you propose. You do a great job in Our Biggest Fight, your, your, your latest book. You do a great job of explaining sort of the basics of how the Internet works. There's already Internet protocols. So the, the protocols drive the Internet now. And what you talk about in your book as a potential technology solution is a new protocol which is very simple, just one more layer of uh, protocol that would be added. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, digital social networking protocol, DSNP, what that is and, and sort of in layman's terms, how it works? Sure. So we, you know, we talked about, I use the American Project as a framing device in the book because the America is built on a, a few thin la layer protocols. Right. It's built on the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. When I say they're thin later, later they're I mean, they're very thin documents. They're very. And, and yet look what we built on top of them, because we build institutions. We build a, we, we build an entire country on uh, with those ideals, those principles, those rights as primary. 
And then we go ahead and we build a, a you know a, a three branch government. We build a whole commercial ecosystem, you know, car, uh, market capitalism, and then you know we build a, a society that thrives and flourish, uh, 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 flourishes. I mean, the greatest country in the world in less than two hundred and fifty years. It's it's a, a, incredible, and we unleashed human ingenuity, right? It, because we we gave people rights and freedoms and liberty. So think of the internet. As, as in, in terms of a few simple protocols, TCP IP, HTTP, and now what we call DSMP as enabling protocols. They're bottom of the stack, very thin. Embrace ideals and values. Return ownership of data, for instance, to individuals. We control our social graph rather than some big platforms. And then you build lots of things on top of it. So it's just about evolution. It's just really when you realize something is not quite right, when the constitution was passed, there were still some things that needed to be fixed. That's why we have a bill of rights. That's why we amend it occasionally. Let's amend these protocols and how they work or add one in this case. And so now the devices will still be connected. The data will still be linked, but we'll be in charge. For the first time, you'll have to be a person on the internet. You'll control your data. You can still be anonymous. You can share some of your data with some apps, other of your data with others. You can rescind the permission. You'll be in charge. And that's what's missing, in my opinion. We can't have an internet where we are being manipulated and controlled, and yet we have a democracy and a set of principles in our society where we're supposed to be in charge as individuals and have freedom and choice. So I think, as I said earlier, one or the other has to give. So a decentralized social networking protocol would would essentially put us in charge of our social graph. That's what it does. And we still, and by the way, it takes the data uh, and, and stores it in the internet itself. Imagine the data that's growing every day being a, 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 um, a public asset. Nobody owns it or everybody owns it, depending on how you want to look at it, except we all own our piece, right? We all, we, we regain our personhood. We regain ownership and control of our, of, of our relationships, of our behaviors, of our choices, of what we do. Now we can share what we want to share about ourselves with others, just as we did in the pre-internet age. It's up to us. The power dynamic changes from a few platforms back to the people, which is why Thomas Paine was so inspirational to me because he, in 1775, said to his fellow settlers in the 13 colonies, we can continue to be subjects, uh, uh, no rights, no ownership, no, no ability to own things, or we can be citizens and have rights, the same rights as the king. We are born with them. They're, they became known as unalienable rights. And we can own property and so on and so forth. It's called being a citizen. Why would we give up citizenship just to use the internet? Don't we want to be a digital citizen, not a digital subject in this day and age? So this is why I think this is so fundamentally important to the future of this great country and obviously to j- just our ability to, to live uh, it's it, it, just wonderful lives and have healthy society and have civilization now move forward because civilization moves forward based on a quest for knowledge and truth. And, and if we were in the age of the world is flat or the world is round, we'd still have, we'd, we'd still be there with half the camp totally sure the world was flat and half the camp totally sure that the world was round and we'd have deep fake videos. For those that thought the world was flat, proving that it's flat. Just to be really clear, I want to make sure everyone really understands this. What you're proposing, part of what you're proposing, the core of it, 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 from my view, is that instead of Google having its own massive profile of each of us and then a separate profile that's held by X and another one that's held by Facebook with up to 52,000 data points or more at each one of these. That's how, that's how much surveillance and data they've gathered. That would all be pulled back away. And the only person that would have control of that data 
would be you, would be us as individuals. Yes. Is that correct? And, and of course, there's value in aggregated data. So there will be apps that are built that we will that will click on our terms of use to use our data to aggregate it for certain purposes. We'll be able to see how it's b- being used. We'll be able to share in the profit if there is profit. We'll be able to feel good about ourselves if we've shared data to cure a disease. We'll, we'll be in charge of us. And when our data is aggregated, it will be on our terms. And it, it is very, very, a very basic concept to put people back in charge. It's not to have an internet, you know, some people would push back and say, oh, it's, you, you need to aggregate data to, to see patterns and be able to really, really get the value of, of, of massive data. Of course. But why would I want all of that to be in the hands of Google or Amazon or Meta? Why isn't that in our hands to decide? Why can't we have millions of new apps that are built that, by the way, are interoperable and our data is portable and we're in charge of how that data moves? You know, there was a day not that long ago where your phone number was, wasn't was yours and you had to be on the same carrier to talk to someone on that. You know, it, so it was geogra- the, the country was divided into seven oligarchs. And if you moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, you needed a new phone or from the north of the country to the south. How it seems silly now in retrospect. Our phone number became portable, the carriers became interoperable, telecom boom. Now our social graphs should be portable, the apps should be interoperable, and we'll see a a, a, a Cambrian explosion, I believe, in possibilities and economic value. And this time around, people will actually be able to share in the value of the most important thing they bring forward, which is their their data, their social graph. And so why would that be, you know, stripped from us and held in, in, you know, by just a few platforms? And by the way, no one can argue that data is not valuable because these companies, five of them are worth $12 trillion. Trillion. And they've got us all hooked, as you as you mentioned earlier, on a lot of the services they, that they provide. I don't know anyone who has a map in their car anymore, right? It's 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 hard to get uh, from 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 where I live in Connecticut in, in into a specific part of New York City without having Google Maps running in 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 the background, right? So. What what happens? I think that the concern or the pushback that some people might have is, well, what what happens if we take all the data away? Are we now going to have to pay for every app that we use and for Google Maps and all the free stuff, free stuff, because they're not taking into account the cost and value of mental health uh, and, and, and harmony in our society? But what what does that potentially look like from a commerce perspective? I think there'll be a vast vast array of possibilities and choices there'll be there'll be uh but we'll be in charge of 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 how we share the data some apps maybe may be built on a subscription base some may be built on an ad base others may be cooperatives others we have a whole group of people in project liberty now that's being formed to actually invent that new world right the smartest economic minds in the world believe that there could be a new data sharing economy that will dwarf the economy we have right now, and by the way, create value for people who are not benefiting from the, the data sh- the, you know the data at all right now. So there is a, a whole new world that's going to going to be built here, just as when we started a telecom company in 1993 against seven oligarchs, you know there was there were people that said, well, it can never change. Well, it did change. And when, when the Telecom Act was passed and our and phone numbers became portable and the carriers interoperable, there were, our, our company became successful. Hundreds of other companies were built. We had a telecommunication boom. The idea that it had to be the way of seven c- companies owning the whole, the whole telecom uh, um, uh, ecosystem turned out to be uh, a, a, a falsehood. And now we have 5G you know, enabling all of what we, this whole internet is enabled by incredibly powerful technology that, that billions and billions and billions and billions of private sector dollars have gone into to build by opening up and leveling that, opening up possibilities and leveling the playing field. So I see, I, I don't see all the possibilities because they're limited by my imagination, right? But there people will bring forward all kinds of possibilities and a whole new economy just as 
progress has always brought forward when you return power to individuals and you create fairness and you open up these possibilities. So this is, this is the moment we're at. And I think it's a, I think it should be viewed as, as a, it, it, not only is this to prevent harms and to bring and, and to strengthen our democracy, this is also about opening up economic possibilities for people. And I think that's right now we're actually having possibilities constrained because these platforms have decided that the data should be used in the way it's being used only now. What if we came up with different ways for this data to be used? So it was for the good of the good of the country and the world and also for people's pocketbooks. Yeah. So you're, you're talking about a, a major evolution in the way the Internet operates and the commerce of the Internet. You've been very upfront about who you are your background, you, you, your parents, uh, your family immigrated from Ireland, you uh, multi-generational, uh, very successful construction firm that you ran for many years um, in Boston, by the way. So uh, it has to be sort of a, that's a rough and tumble industry, right? The, the, the Northeast construction industry is not known for being um, genteel. So uh, you, you, you've, you've got some backbone, which is a prerequisite, I think, for this fight that you're taking on. And you've pledged a huge portion of your fortune to, to this fight and to Project Liberty. I, I I think these things are all essential and someone like you needs to be the person that at least gets the, the discussion going because you, you're picking a fight with the modern day robber barons. I mean, the, the, you're picking a fight with billionaires who obviously have a, a vested interest in the status quo of the Internet um, and they have lots of money. Their companies have lots of money. And in Washington, D.C., money equates to influence. How do you move this forward? How how do you get this off the ground? And what do these 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 oligarchs of the Internet, what do they do? What, what, what do they say to you when you talk to them? Well, that's the easy one. No, no comment is what they say at the moment. Uh, and uh, but let's go back to the beginning of your look. I, I, I'm I'm blessed, you know. I have, you know, I have lots of money and uh, a, a great network of of friends and people I can talk to and so on and so forth. Most importantly, I have seven children, so I can sit here with my money and my network and my access and so forth and do nothing to protect my children, or. I can do everything I, I'm capable of doing to protect my children and other children and encourage you to do the same and encourage other people. And have, and, and I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to have the time with you because you have access to to, um, you know, many people that you can share this with. Some may agree with us. Some may disagree. It's their prerogative. But for those that agree, get involved. Join the fight. I can't do this alone. I can get things going and I can dedicate a certain amount of money to this and we can i can bring on brilliant technologists to fix the technology and i can write a book and i can get people excited because i i'm very passionate about this but um i'm one person we just need to it's not i i didn't choose a title my biggest fight you know it's our biggest fight it has to be to win we need a million davids to take on these goliaths not one little david so I, I just think that this is this is the most important work I've ever done. Yes, I have the background I have and the experiences I had and, and, and which has you know it made me who I am today. But I see it all as having equipped me. It's given me the, the ability to to take on this challenge and do something about it. But I'll tell you what, I grew up in that Irish family in Boston, one of seven siblings, and I was at my mom's dinner table. And we were pretty good at describing problems, but no dinner would end without her saying, you kids have figured out the problem. What are you going to do about it now? And so when you have that kind of hard wiring and you have that expectation of your parents, you know, it's not something you you leave behind. It's something you think about every single day. And I think lots of us were blessed with parents that urged us to do the same, urged us to make the change, not leave it to someone else. And we find that suddenly 
one person becomes 10, 10 becomes 100, 100 becomes 1,000, 1,000 is 100,000, then it's a million. Then people say, you know what, it, it, we, can, we can do this. So it's, this is a collective action. Yes, it starts with individual conversations like, th- like this, but then it, those conversations need to echo and expand. And, that, and that's, that's where we're at now. And I urge people, please take a few hours of your precious time. Read or listen to the book. Share your thoughts with us. Go to ourbiggestfight.com. Share what you're thinking. If you disagree, tell us why. If you want to get it involved, involved tell us how. And, and, and then socialize this. Talk about it at your own kitchen tables. Talk about it on the sideline of the, of the youth soccer pitch to other parents at, 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 at school. Go to teachers and, 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 and say, what, what are we doing in our schools? And I'm not talking just universities. I'm talking grade school middle school, high school, talk about it after church, talk about it wherever, and just let's begin to socialize this. And I am, and my gut, strong gut feeling here is millions and millions of people are seeing and, and feeling the exact same thing, Ed, you and I are. Frank McCourt, I am rooting for you. I'll do whatever I can to help you. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you telling the story and taking on this fight. It's so important. Um, I wish you Godspeed and I hope everyone takes a minute to read our biggest fight. Thanks for your time and appreciate it. Look forward to the next time. This is a huge topic and there's a lot that Frank and I didn't get to. To learn more about Frank's vision for reclaiming our digital privacy and changing the internet for the benefit of everyone, not just a few tech billionaires, go to ourbiggestfight.com. Thanks for watching.